Hello and welcome. In this video, we're going to talk about principal component analysis. If you follow our channel closely, you might have already seen a video that covers all the theoretical aspects of this technique. Principal component analysis forms the backbone of unsupervised machine learning, and it is used for dimension reduction. Having gone through the theory part of it, this is the time for hands-on. We will take a simple data set and show you principal component analysis in a step-by-step -step way. If you follow this video end to end, you would probably not need any other reference to learn about PC any further. We'll do everything to a great depth in a step-by-step -step way so that you get complete conceptual clarity. The data set that we've chosen for this exercise is known as pizza. So this data set is about pizzas and the ingredients of pizzas. It starts with the column called brand, which is essentially just a label, an ID which identifies the type of pizza, and then there are different ingredients. So starting with the moisture, which is the amount of water per 100 grams in the sample, the protein content per 100 grams in the sample, the fat content, the ash per 100 grams. So all these variables like sodium, carbohydrates, and calories per 100 grams are the features that we have. As you know, the idea of PCA is that it receives inputs which are correlated and then gives you an output which will be the principal components which will be totally uncorrelated. So we're starting with the raw data at this stage. We don't know if these variables are correlated or not. We'll check that. And if they are correlated, then PCA makes sense on this. I've given the reference for the data source also. If you want to check this out yourself, you can do that. So let's begin step by step. I'm using a pre-typed code so that we can save time. Otherwise, it will increase the video duration further. We're calling some of the basic libraries that you typically need in Python. So NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, and Seaborn. Matplotlib and Seaborn for visualization, NumPy and Pandas for working with the data. So we're just importing these libraries. And this data set is already available in my current directory. So I will be able to read it using the read CSV method from Pandas. So we've read the data now. Let's check what are the first few observations of the data. We can do that by checking the head. This is how the data looks like. So brand A, maybe we have different categories here. There is an ID of the product or the pizza. And these are the measured values that we have for all the features. Notice PCA is not something that you typically apply for a data set with seven, eight columns. But to get a better understanding, this is good enough. Let's check the info of the data frame, which will tell us about the dimensions as well as the nature of the variables. If we have any ambiguities in terms of data types and all, we'll get to know here. So we have 300 rows in our data and we have nine columns. The columns are visible here as well. And when we talk about the values present in columns, it shows that all the columns have all the cells occupied. We don't have any null entry here so far. And the nature of the variables is something that's anticipated. So these are all numerical variables. ID is an integer, which is a rounded off number. And brand is an object, which is more of a category. So we have seven float type variables, which may have decimals also. We have one integer and one object type variable. While we are doing PCA, in this process, you'll also get to know a lot about data preparation. The first step is to check if we have any duplicate entry. Let's check duplicates, but we don't want to check duplicates on the entire row. Since we have a column called ID, we may want to check duplicates on the ID itself. So there is a method which is called duplicated, where you can choose one or more columns where you want to check duplicates. If you don't mention anything, it will check the entire row for similarity. And when we do a dot sum, it will give us the count of duplicates. So we actually seem to have nine duplicates here in this case. Let's see what are those records. So these are the nine excess records. One copy of these duplicates is already there in the original data frame. These are the, the additional copies that we have. Now, should we drop it? Should we keep it? Is a question that comes here. See, it's about the ingredients in a product. There are many products that we buy which contain ingredients, and there would always be a standard reference written at the back of the packet. It doesn't make that sample bad in any way. As such, the amount of such records in our data is limited. So this is totally acceptable that somebody might have analyzed the same kind of pizza a couple of times. See, in our case, this is nine records out of 300. So this hardly is any percentage which makes a difference in our analysis. We can continue to proceed with it as is without worrying too much about it. 
But if it bothers you, you can simply go ahead and drop these records. The idea is for any data set, we should first ask whether the duplicates are possible or not. We are not interested in duplicates, which are copy paste errors. But if sampling is such that some observations will be repeated, maybe it's one of their best selling pizzas, right? So if that's the case, then we may go ahead and keep those records as is and proceed. So in this case, we choose to do just that. Let's check for missing values. While we already saw that the cells are all occupied, we may just check if we have any ambiguity in terms of missing values over and above, we don't seem to have. So all the columns have cells which are completely occupied. There is no missing data. At this stage, we know that principal component analysis is the analysis of correlations. So carrying forward a categorical column like brand would not make sense. And ID is more of an identifier. We've already used it for checking duplicates. So there's no point carrying forward the ID as well in the future analysis. At this stage, we take a subset of the original data, dropping these two columns, and we store it as DF underscore PCA, data frame PCA, right? So we'll just simply go ahead and drop these two columns. Now we can check the first few records of the data frame that we've shortlisted. This is what we have, pretty much the way we saw earlier, except for these two columns that we had. Let's move ahead and check how many columns we are left with. So it may not make sense right now because we can easily count it. But if you have too many columns, you may just want to check after dropping a certain number of columns, what are you left with? Now, since all the columns are numerical in nature, particularly float, there is a recommended visualization type for such columns. We may want to use box plots to check if our data contains some extreme values and what are the data distributions like. Since we are going to do the same exercise with all the variables, it'll be wise to put this through a loop. What we'll do is that without writing codes multiple times for the same task, we can give it to the loop and it'll do the job for us. So what we are saying is that we will select all the columns from this PCA data set. This will re return a list of all the features and we are iterating over it. We are saying we'll go over the length of all the features, which means whatever is the number of features, we are going to go over that list. And we are dividing the plotting area using subplot into two rows and four columns. See, we had seven columns, so this can be accommodated into eight blocks, right? So one block would be empty. That's totally fine. We are doing the index as I plus one because when we iterate over a list, the indexing in Python starts with zero. But subplot does not understand the zeroth plot, so it will start the indexing from one itself. That's why we are adding one. So when we enter the zeroth value of the list, it will be our first plot. And which plot are we looking at? We are going to look at the box plot from this data frame. We are giving the title also dynamically. We will be taking this as a placeholder where as we are iterating over a variable, it will bring its name there. And this type layout is being used here to ensure that all these plots are nicely separated. So let's run this and see what happens. We got all the plots. So we seem to have some variables which are free from outliers like moisture, like protein, like ash, like carbs, but there are variables which seem to have outliers. This is a separate discussion how we should go about treating the outliers. In fact, we've done a sequence of videos on data preparation itself, you may refer to that. But for now, the motivation for us is to learn PCA. And we know PCA is affected by outliers. Why? Because PCA is supposed to be performed on a data which has correlations. Now the formula for correlation repeatedly uses averages. So if you have outliers, the averages would not be very helpful. That's why, for principal component analysis, it is required that we treat the outliers first. So how do we go about treating the outliers? We are writing a function here called remove outlier, which takes input as every column, every single column. Then we are using the quantile method to estimate the 25th and 75th quantile, Q1 and Q3 respectively. IQR or the interquartile range is the difference between Q3 and Q1. Basically, that's the middle 50% of the data. Now, the typical definition for an outlier is a value which is below the lower limit or Q1 minus 1.5 IQR, or it is above the upper limit, which is Q3 plus 1.5 IQR. These are the typical definitions. These may vary depending on the domain as well. But since we are not going that deep into the domain aspect of it today, we'll just go with these standard definitions. End of the day, this function returns us the lower limit and the upper limit as mentioned here. Lower limit below which a value is an outlier, upper limit above which a value is an outlier. Once we get those values, 
we will do the treatment. So let's first write the function, which kind of takes the input as the column and returns these values. And now let's see how do we use this function. So what we are saying is that let's apply this function to every single feature. Once again, if you see, we're using a for loop. This is a repeated exercise. You want to do this for every single column. So we are saying that we will apply this function to every column. If the column happens to have a value which is greater than the upper limit, we will bring it to the upper limit. Otherwise, we'll leave it untouched. So this np.where is just like an if-else condition. If this condition is satisfied, then we go with this alternative, else we go with this alternative. Only if the value is greater than the upper limit or less than the lower limit, we bring them to the upper limit and lower limit respectively, else we leave it untouched. This technique is known as winsorization. The upper limit treatment is called capping and the lower limit treatment is called flooring. So we are doing that. And just to double check if this worked or not, we will redo the same code for visualization that I just explained some time back to see if the outliers have been treated. So see, now it seems that the outliers have been completely treated. We don't see the outliers as we could see earlier. Please note that there could be times when even after doing this treatment, you see some outliers because the quantiles will be reworked when the data is treated. But there's nothing to worry about. We don't keep on doing that in cycle. We've just done it once and that's sufficient. Let's look at the descriptive features of the PCA data set once we have treated the outliers. So this kind of tells us about the descriptive summary of the data. What is the minimum moisture content? What is the minimum protein content? What is the maximum protein content? So on and so forth for all the features. So we can always write some inferences based on the descriptive statistics. We can also look at the similarity between the mean and the median to anticipate a little bit about the presence of outliers. But we've already kind of checked that, so we're not doing that again. One more piece. Our original data had features on different scales. For example, if you see, the values like ash and sodium, which are just about 5.4 grams and one gram approximately maximum. Whereas the values of moisture, values of protein are going to the extent of 57 grams and 28 grams approximately. So they are on very different scales. It will be a good idea in this case to bring all the variables on the same scale. And that's what we are doing by scaling the data. So we are saying let's scale the data. We are performing a standard scaling or you can say z-score. That's one and the same thing. So taking the entire data, we are converting it into a scaled format. What does it do? It brings the data in a common range of negative three to three for 99% of the cases. That's what we've done here. If you look at the data, data looks a little different now. Any value which would have been below average for a column would have become negative. Any value which was above average for a column would have become positive. But that's just to bring all the variables on the same page. Now we are going to check if we have correlations in the data. So we are going to perform correlation check and we are going to visualize the correlations using heat maps, which will give a color coding as per the correlation strength. Let me run this. This is the correlation matrix. Now, if you see, this has a diagonal and this is symmetric across the diagonal. Generally, if you have values to the tune of 0.8 or above, that's considered a strong correlation. We have a couple of places where we have values which are almost 0.8 or a little above 0.8 or even 0.9 in either direction. It could be positive, it could be negative. For example, ash and protein seem to be correlated. Fat and ash seem to be somewhat correlated. Similarly, sodium and fat seem to be somewhat correlated. Carb and ash seem to have a negative correlation. This is how the data is. So we have places where we have decent amount of correlations. If we have correlations in the data, that forms an appropriate case for principal component analysis. Essentially, principal component analysis is used to eliminate correlations in the data, eliminate the redundancy in the data, but can be statistically validate this as well. But since this video has already become too long, we'll take that up in the subsequent video. I hope you've enjoyed the data preparation journey so far. All these steps are very crucial when it comes to principal component analysis. Up next is even more exciting content that will give you meaningful insights related to principal component analysis. Make sure you watch that video for complete understanding.